think we most often look at it, and it certainly is, applies in this way, but I think most of the time when we see that word quickened, we think of something dead being made alive. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, gives us more information along these lines. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Here quickeneth is uh, understood to be driving out the works of sin and death and restoring our bodies, our mortal bodies, back to health. But there's another way that I want you to look at being quickened as well. And so I'd like for you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. This is on, uh, after Jesus is raised from the dead, the same day that he was raised from the dead. Beginning in verse 13, it said, And behold, two of them went that same day into a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Do you see that phrase or that word holden? It literally means to seize or restrain. To seize or to restrain. Now here are two of the 12. We don't know which two they are. But they're walking along on this day trip between Jerusalem and Emmaus. And they're talking about the things that have happened. Jesus has already been raised from the dead. He's already appeared to the disciples together. We have to assume that they were with him when this, uh, with the group when this happened. But here where it says their eyes were hold, hold, holden that they should not know him, it's talking about how the, uh, the flesh is unable to see things on the spirit, in the spirit realm or on the spiritual side of things. Their eyes were held from being able to see what was real and who Jesus really was. But Jesus joined himself to them and said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and, and, the, and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered them to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. He's talking about the third day since the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Yet, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and so all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Here's Jesus giving a firsthand account to these two disciples of everything, starting with the law of Moses, that the Bible said about him and the things he fulfilled. I wish there were tapes of that. Wouldn't that have been just, what word do you use? Awesome is too, uh, too slight a word. What an incredible thing took place. And they drew nigh unto the village where they went. And he, speaking of Jesus, he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. Now notice verse 31, and their eyes were opened. Now it's not talking about their physical eyes. It's talking about their spiritual eyes. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened up unto us the scriptures? I love that phrase. Didn't our hearts burn within us when he was telling us? Now, folks, this is a quickening that took place. They were quickened in spirit. They weren't dead and then made alive. If we combine this account with John's account, in John chapter 20, on the day of Jesus' resurrection, where he appears to the disciples, and breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. They had to be born again. 
They had to have received something of God. We know it couldn't have been the baptism of the Spirit because that didn't happen for another 40-something days after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost. So if we put these two stories together, if they, if they do fit together, and if, uh, if they're inspired by the Holy Ghost, then they'd have to. If we put these two things together, these guys have just newly been saved, but they still couldn't see things as they ought to or as they really were. But when their eyes were opened, when their eyes were opened, there are some things that the Lord's been dealing with me about um, well over some period of time, but it seems that, that um, many times when the Holy Ghost starts dealing with me about something, there'll be an emphasis that he'll put on some aspect of the word or scriptures for a period of time, and then that'll seem to drift. And then it'll come back maybe weeks later, maybe months later. And there are things that, uh, that I have to conclude by the Holy Ghost that he doesn't want me, want me to get far away from. And I, I understand that that's why they keep coming back up. Because there are things there that we haven't seen or things that I haven't seen that he wants me to see. The problem with not being able to see th certain things is you don't know what you don't see until you see it. I hope that makes sense. We don't know what we can't see until we come to the place where we can see it. And then we can look back and say, oh, wow, how dumb was I? Or how blind was I? It takes a quickening of the Holy Ghost or an eye-opening experience with the Holy Ghost to even come to the place where you see what you didn't know or see what you didn't see. I know there, there are um, dozens of stories that we could tell, and maybe you could tell some on your own, about people that were quickened by the Spirit of God to really see the truth of the Scripture. One of my favorite stories or examples of this, and I've talked about it here recently in healing school, is the story of John Alexander Dowie. When he was a young man in ministry and just barely starting off, really, he was pastoring a, a community church, a small community church, and the region, uh, this was in uh, Australia, I believe, and the place where the town or the city or the village, whatever it was that he was pastoring, came under an attack of some kind of plague, some kind of sickness. I don't know that it's ever really been identified. If it has, I haven't read it to know what to tell you. But it was something that was just sweeping through that, not just the town, but through that whole area. And there were 40 people in his church that had already died. Some had been buried, some were awaiting burial. And people were dying at such a rate that they couldn't keep up with the, uh, the burial sites and that type of stuff. And, and you could well understand how destroyed, devastated he as the pastor of this church was with the number of people in his congregation that were dying. So he cried out to the Lord. He'd just come back from the, the makeshift hospital that they had to set up because of the, uh, the number of people that were being affected by this disease he came back to his home and he cried out to the lord and he said lord is everybody going to die or is all my church going to die and he said like a flash of lightning he said he saw acts 10 38 he wasn't reading his bible he was laying on the floor on his face crying out to god and he said it was like it was just appeared in front of him and he could see it now, Acts 10, 38, if you're not familiar with it, it, says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost in power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And he giving testimony, Dr. Dowie giving testimony of this many time, many, on many occasions and some years later. He said, instantly I knew everything I needed to know about sickness and disease. He said, I saw very clearly that the Bible identified sickness and disease as being the work of the devil. See, before then, he was praying along with everybody else, Lord, if it be your will, let these people be healed. And they continued to die one right after the other. But he saw it. 
He saw that sickness was of the devil, that healing was good and healing was of God. And Jesus was the healer. And Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And he got off of that floor, got off of his face, raised his hand toward God. And he said, I see it. From this point forward, not another church member will contract this disease or die. Well, he still had some people in his church that were in the hospital, hadn't died yet, and they recovered. And it was huge news, great news, in that, uh, not just in that town or village, but throughout all that area. Because here was one man who by one quickening work of the Holy Ghost saw the truth of sickness and disease. Now, folks, Dr. Dowie had read Acts 10, 38 before. He had read it. We can't say that he didn't see it because he knew what the Scripture said. But there's a difference when the Holy Ghost opens your eyes to what's being said and just being able to read something on the page. And, and is that not in line with what Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would do? One of the things he said, and John gives us this record, he said the Holy Ghost will guide you into all truth. He'll guide you into all truth. Well, that word truth is the word reality. It's the same word that's used when Jesus is after the Last Supper with his disciples. How that when he goes to prayer, he prays, Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Same word truth, same word reality. So we have to recognize and conclude that the Holy Ghost is going to lead us into the reality or lead us into the truth, and the word is the truth, the word is reality then he's certainly going to start first and foremost to lead us into the Word. Well, what does that look like if not the same thing that Dr. Dowie talked about with Acts 10.38? See, if the Holy Ghost is going to lead you into the truth or guide you into all reality, then that means he's going to show you and have to open your eyes to the Word of God that we don't yet see. We may be reading it, but from our hearts we don't yet see it. I remember Brother Hagin telling a couple of stories along this line one of them was when he was praying for his brother, Dub. Dub was an older guy, several years older than Brother Hagen, And he was one of the roughest guys that you could possibly imagine. I mean, this guy back in the, the 20s and, and um, the 1920s ran with some of the biggest gangsters like John Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd and all these guys that are romanticized in books and tales of old. He was right there with these guys. There's no telling all the terrible and awful things that he did. Well, you could well understand that Brother Hagen would be concerned about his brother. If he died in that condition, he's going to go to hell and spend all eternity in hell. And even though he'd done some bad things, and even though he was a criminal, at least by association, Brother Hagen cared for his brother. And so he had been praying for his brother for years and years and years. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to him. It wasn't the same thing where he saw something in the Scripture, but the Lord spoke to him. After Brother Hagin had cried out, Lord, save Dub. The Holy Ghost spoke back to him and said, that's what I'm trying to do. And Brother Hagin said, what do you mean? And he brought him to the word where it says, Jesus died for the sins of the world. And the Lord began to speak to him and said, you, and talking about the church at large as well, he said, you and the rest of the church are praying for me to do things that I've already done. I've already saved up. I already shed my blood for him. And then Brother Hagin asked the Lord, then what should I do? He said, "Claim first of all, command the devil to take his hands off your brother. Second of all, pray that someone would come across his path to be able to share the truth of the word with him. And then third, Pray that the eyes of his spirit would be open so that he'd be receptive to it. Brother Hagin said that he prayed with a new confidence that day. And within just a matter of two or three weeks, his brother was saved. After having spent years and years praying for him, once he saw from the word, now I'm not sure this would exactly qualify in the same context as Acts 10.38 did with John Alexander Dowie, but it was Revelation. And we have to recognize and we'd have to conclude that that's a quickening of the Holy Spirit too, isn't it? See, being quickened by the Spirit does not just mean made alive. Some part of, 
uh, the law of sin and death passing away and us being made alive, but it would also include revelation because that's life too, isn't it? Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, he said, the flesh profits nothing. But he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they're life. Spirit and life. Well, life is the result of being quickened, isn't it? I've told you the story about how the Lord led me to seek his face. He gave me some instruction when I first began to, to uh, work with Brother Hagin. He gave me some instruction to seek his face. Well, I didn't know what that meant. This was before smartphones and iPods and Apple, uh, I mean, iPads and all that kind of stuff. So in the summer campaign that we went to the northeast part of the country, I took with me Strong's Concordance. And I started looking up everything in the Bible where it talks about seeking God's face. I spent hours going through and copying over scriptures and reading scriptures. And it didn't feel like anything was happening because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know if what I was doing was the right thing to do. But at the end of that campaign, some eight weeks or so later, I was walking into the office building, the office complex at Kenneth Hagin Ministries in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And I was halfway up the steps to the second floor to go to my office. And as quick as a flash of lightning, I saw Hebrews 11:6. Now, I'd been reading it all summer long, along with a lot of other scriptures, and it really didn't make any more impact on me when I read it than any of the others. It's not like I got to Hebrews 11:6 and says, oh, okay, here it is. This is what I've been looking for. It seemed as dead as the rest of them did. But the Lord opened my eyes to it. Hebrews 11:6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For they that cometh to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And as quick as a flash, I saw I've got to believe that he's my rewarder because I've been seeking him. I don't know if I was seeking him in the most effective way, but I was seeking him in the only way that I knew. And when in just a few days, I'd gotten a, a raise that more than doubled my salary. Now, folks, Hebrews 11, 6 will never leave me. Because once we are quickened by the Spirit of God to some truth or some revelation like that, it stays with you forever. It stays forever. Now, what if the whole Bible was quickened to us like that? Again, I'm sure you've got experiences, similar experiences as the ones that I'm relating. Things that the Holy Ghost has opened your eyes, your spiritual eyes to. I firmly believe that the whole of the Word of God should be quickened to our spirits just like that. And I have no reason to doubt that when we get to heaven and this body of flesh is changed and we receive our redeemed bodies, that's going to be a part of the work that's done in us once we're there. Why else would God give us His Word if He didn't want every part of it, every word, every piece, every scripture, every phrase to be quickened to our hearts? This word quicken in the Old Testament Hebrew is an interesting word. It's used 12 times in the Old Testament. And of those 12 times, David uses it nine times in one psalm. Psalm 119, verse 25, it says, My soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken thou me according to thy word. Verse 37, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Verse 40, behold, I have longed after thy precepts, quicken me in thy righteousness. Verse 88, quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Verse 107, I am afflicted very much, quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Verse 149, hear, O Lord, or hear my voice, according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgment. Verse 154, plead my cause and deliver me, quicken me according to thy word. Verse 156, great are thy tender mercies, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgments. 
Verse 159, consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Now, what's David asking for? He seems to be talking about a quickening power or a quickening work of God similar to what we've described. He's not talking about his life is full of death and he's looking for God to make a change and bring the dead things back to life. He's talking about being able to see and understand God and his ways. And notice what he requested to be quickened by. Quicken me according to your word. Quicken me according to your loving kindness. Quicken me according to your faithfulness. Quicken me according to thy judgments. You know, so often I think we are stuck on the judgments part. And we think that God is looking for a way to judge us because of the wrongdoings that we have partaken of the sins we've committed or whatever but judgment is not something that we should fear if we've made jesus the lord of our lives and if we sincerely wanted to follow god and are attempting to live our lives based on his word the judgment of god is always in your favor the judgment of god is something that brings blessing into your life the judgment of god is a reward not something to fear or shy away from I think we spend so much of our time hearing from the devil about what's wrong with us that we fail to recognize that God has quickened us in such a way. And here I'm talking about made alive from the dead, spiritually quickened us. First Peter 3, 18, for example, says Christ is a quickening spirit. He was quickened in spirit. Paul wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 I believe it is and he said that Jesus is a quickening spirit Adam was flesh but Jesus was made a quickening spirit a life giving spirit that life's in us now if he's our Lord if we've given our hearts to him if we've come into the family of God that life permeates and saturates every fiber of our being we may not feel like it does we may never feel it but that's exactly what the Bible says has taken place. I've been inspired here lately, and I want to invite you to join me in this, to seek the quickening work of God, to seek to be quickened, to pray for the quickening work of God. You know, there's so many things that our spirits, um, how do I say this? There are ways that our spirits deal with things that the closer and closer we get to God in fellowship and through the word, there are many places and many ways that our spirits take over, and that's what they're supposed to do. There are times where, here just recently, I woke up singing an old, an old hymn, and I don't even know the, song, the words to the song. You may know it. It's Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Folks, I never sing that song, but I woke up in the middle of the night just two or three days ago singing that out loud. Well, it sure wasn't my body that was singing. It wasn't my mind that was doing anything. My body was still in. My mind was uh, inoperable, at least, well, it was asleep, whatever it does when you're asleep. But your spirit never sleeps. Your spirit's in constant communication with God if he's your father. There are things that the Lord has spoken to me over the last number of years relative to this attack of the devil, this physical attack of the devil. There are four or five things that the Lord has told me, experiences like with Hebrews eleven six. 6. In some cases, they were scriptures that I was already confessing. For example, he spoke to me, according to the psalm 91 verse 14 now verse 14 15 and 16 is something that i've been confessing for almost 30 years i guess it goes like this because he has said it starts off with god speaking first person because he has set his love upon me i will deliver him because he's known my name i'll set him on high 
when he calleth unto me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. I will deliver him. With long life will I satisfy you and show me your salvation. Now, folks, I've been quoting that from my standpoint. I've been quoting because I've set my love upon you. You deliver me. But when the Lord woke me up one morning just as I was waking up, the Lord spoke the first part of that scripture, not even the whole thing, but the first part of that scripture, because you've set your love on me. Well, here it's gone from where I was confessing the fact that I'd set my love on the Lord to the Lord responding, you have set your love on me. I can't tell you what a lift that was to me. I can't tell you, even though we didn't quote, finish the rest of the sentence or the rest of the scripture, the rest of the scripture is because you've set your love on me, I'll deliver you. Man, deliverance was mine. Well, it's been several years since then. Doesn't matter to me. Deliverance is still mine. One of the next things that he spoke to me a year or so later was in Psalm 103. First part of the psalm is, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who, well, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. And this is the part where the Lord spoke back to me. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. The rest of the verse, and he only gave me the first half, but the rest of the verse is, he redeemeth my life from destruction and crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. That was something else I'd been confessing for many years. But now instead of me just saying it to him, he's saying it back to me. Well, there again, it's been several years since then. But redemption is mine and it'll always be mine. No matter what it feels like, no matter what it looks like, no matter what anybody else thinks. And folks, there are a lot of people out there that are thinking whatever they want to about it. But he redeems my life from destruction. A couple of years later, I woke up one morning and it wasn't something that he spoke to me in the same manner that the other times, the other ways that it came. But I had two dreams, one right after another, just lightning fast. In the first dream, he said to me, I will lift the burden from your shoulders. And in the second dream, he said, I will take the yoke from off thy neck. And I'll have to admit, one of the things that I was most blessed by, I guess, was the difference in the way that it came. I have a hard time describing how the dreams were, but I knew they were dreams. I knew I was hearing from him in, in two dreams, one right after the another. And I didn't know where that scripture was. I had read it a number of times. It, was, it wasn't something I committed to memory. But the last part of that verse, it's Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And the last part of that verse is one that I heard lots and lots and lots of times. It says, and the oak shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Brother Hagin talked on that and, and used that scripture and referred to that scripture hundreds of times while I was with him. Hundreds of times. But I couldn't have told you if you'd asked me beforehand, what does Isaiah 10, 27 say? I would have had to tell you about what the last part says about the anointing, but have, would have had no clue about the first part. I'll lift the burden off your shoulders and take the yoke off your neck. That's mine. I hope it blesses you, but that scripture is mine. Another time. And this was a different situation as well. I had gotten to the place where I was thinking, all right, now something's got to be gumming this up. I know that the Bible, the only identifying factor that the Bible ever gives about the hindrance to faith is unforgiveness. And I had examined my heart and, and dealt with things. I knew I wasn't walking out of, uh, or taking a step outside of love or walking in unforgiveness to anybody. But I determined that I was going to fast for a period of time and seek the Lord about if there's anything else I need to do. And my heart was right about it, although looking back at it, I can see where it was a mistake. But I just let the Lord know. I said, okay, Lord, beginning today, 
I'm going to start a fast to hear from you to find out if there's anything I need to do, anything I need to stop doing, anything I need to change, anything I need to adjust. And folks, there was a, a, a sure foundation, I, I thought, for doing that because Again, being around Brother Hagen, I heard him say things and quote other people saying things like, if I'm believing God for something and things don't change, I don't start looking at God, I start changing myself. And that's all I was trying to do. I was trying to come to the place where I knew what I should do, and once I knew it, I was willing to do it. But when I announced to the Lord, okay, here we go. I'm going to start this fast to find out if there's anything I should do. Instantly, immediately, Fast as lightning flies. He quoted Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Have faith in God. And I knew I had my answer. Shortest fast I've ever been on in my life. And I could see clearly when he spoke it to me, I could see clearly what he was doing. He was keeping me from getting into a place that might have led me to unbelief. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Folks, when you come to the place where you've done everything there is to do, you've done everything there is to do. Mark eleven twenty two belongs to me in a different way now than it ever did before. Now turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Let me close with this. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 16. Paul, writing to the church, said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Notice that phrase, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Your, the word understanding there is the word spirit. It's translated spirit in several other, many other translations. He's talking about our spiritual eyes being opened. The eyes of your understanding or your spirit being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Let me interrupt there for a minute and make a couple of comments. Every time the Lord has quickened something to my spirit, like those verses that I just told you, like the, the things that I referred to you concerning Acts 1038 with John Alexander Dowie, The enlightenment that comes. The reason those scriptures become yours is because you see them in a different way than you ever did before. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of your spirits being enlightened. That's what we need, isn't it? We need our spiritual eyes to be open. That's what Paul is praying first and foremost. That's what Paul is praying for the church. And you can look at just about every letter he wrote to the churches and find some variation of this prayer that he's praying for them too. He doesn't use always the same words, but it's pretty much the same thought. Some prayers like this one to the Ephesians and uh, like the letter that he wrote to the Colossians, they're longer prayers than some of the others. With some of the others, they're just a few short statements. Whereas in these two letters Ephesians and Colossians he spends a little bit more time identifying his prayer and the Holy Ghost saw fit for us to have a record of it why would that be we would have to conclude that this is a spirit inspired prayer Paul has to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to pray this way for the Holy Spirit to save us a record of it Well, if it's an inspired prayer for Paul and it's given by the Holy Ghost, it'd have to be inspired for us too. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That seems to me exactly what happened to those two guys on the road to Emmaus. The eyes of their understanding was enlightened. First, Jesus revealed everything that the Bible says, beginning with Moses and the prophets. All the things that were spoken and written about him, that was certainly enlightenment, I'm sure. 
But then their eyes were opened and they saw him for who he was. They saw things according to truth. They saw the reality of the situation. Now, folks, God's no respecter of persons. If he wanted those two disciples to have their spiritual eyes opened, their understanding being enlightened, why would he not want the same for us? Paul seems to place a high value on this because he's praying it for him constantly. He said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. The eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Folks, there's a greater desire, a greater need for the laws, uh, the spirit of seeing and knowing than any other thing in the body of Christ. The greatest thing that we need worldwide is the renewing of the mind. And the renewing of the mind comes in great degree by revelation or the quickening of the spirit. I've begun to pray that the Holy Ghost will quicken my spirit according to his faithfulness according to his word according to his judgments in every area that there is and he's answering my prayer i'm seeing things that i've never seen before from scriptures that i've read thousands of times they're not all big earth-shattering life-changing things But it's Holy Ghost. So Paul prayed for the church continually that God would give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, not wonder, not hope so, not maybe so, but that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, folks, if our spiritual understanding was enlightened, if our spiritual eyes were opened, if we were quickened of the Holy Ghost, if every one of us was quickened of the Holy Ghost to know what is the hope of his calling, to know specifically what our part in the body of Christ is and how to walk in it. And if every one of our understanding was opened, or we were quickened by the Spirit of God to know what the riches of the glory of His inheritance is in the saints. What belongs to us because we're in the body of Christ. And if every one of us was quickened by the Spirit to know the exceeding greatness of His power that works in us as believers. What could stop us? I submit to you that if we had our eyes opened in that degree... We could be even, as they said of the church of old, they that have turned the world upside down have come here too. Furthermore, I would submit to you that these are three things that Jesus' eyes were open to. He knew what the hope of his calling was. He knew what belonged to him because he was a child of God. And he knew the exceeding greatness of his power. The anointing that was given to him when he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. So if we wanted to say it this way, if our eyes were enlightened, our spiritual eyes were open, if we were quickened by the Holy Ghost to know those three things, doing the works of Jesus would be commonplace. There'd be no question in anybody's mind about what God's will is concerning healing the sick, even raising the dead. These are things that Jesus was quickened to or quickened unto. Paul seems to be telling us by the Spirit of God that we should be too. I believe this is the same thing that Paul is saying when he said he counted everything that he had done as worthless, as less than worthless, 
And the only thing that he cared about was to know him. Talking about knowing our Father. And to know the fellowship of his suffering. I think that's Paul's manifest praying for himself. For his eyes to be open just like he wanted ours to be too. As such, I believe we have a great and firm foundation to seek the quickening of the Holy Ghost in our lives. He would have to want it for us. He couldn't say the things that he said, even just the scriptures that we read, and we could take it to many others to confirm the same truth. And the Holy Ghost couldn't have given us those scriptures unless it was the will of God for us to have and to know it. He wants us to see it. He wants us to see what we don't see. He wants us to know what we don't yet know. So I want to encourage you to join me in praying for the quickening of the Holy Spirit. That he'll guide us into all truth. Guide us into all reality. He knows what you need to see. He knows what I need to see. Maybe I need to see something different than you see. Maybe I need to know something different than what you need to know because of the different work he's got for each one of us. But whatever it is, he wants us to see and know. And I believe that's going to become more important the further and further we go and the closer and closer we get to the end. What a tragedy it would be for us to get to the end and find out what we could have had or what we could have known or what we could have seen. But we were too wrapped up in the physical things around us to take hold of them. What greater tragedy could, be, could there be than that? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the exceeding greatness of your power that works in each one of us. I thank you that you've got a calling for, upon each and every one of us. I thank you that you have revealed to us the riches of the glory of our inheritance as children of God. Holy Spirit, we ask you, we seek your quickening power. Show us what we need to know. Teach us according to the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. We desire to see what we don't yet see. We desire to know what we don't yet know. Quicken us according to your faithfulness. Quicken us according to your word. Quicken us according to your judgments. Quicken us, Father, by the Holy Spirit. Open our eyes just like you did the disciples that walked with you to Emmaus. Quicken us in the same way. We ask in Jesus' name.